Good morning. So today has been an extraordinary day. Um, I am in a remote location and I do not have my phone with me. So I had to uh, take a moment away from my studies because I don't exactly have what I need um, to do them today. So I thought it would be a really great idea if I would just settle down and pray. And one of my favorite places to do that is oh, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And my Catholic friends will tell you how much I value um, time away for meditation at the monastery or just time away in the Catholic Church. Um, you know, this is not to negate any of the the awesomeness of the edifice of the Baptist church that I was raised in or the non-denominational church that I serve in. But I truly do enjoy um, the shrines and the pieces that represent Christ. And this is the Basilica for um, the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, the Immaculate Conception. And I used to live down the street from here and I would come down here all the time and pray and just spend time with the guide and really try to get... Um, you know, direction and build my endurance for prayer and meditation and whatnot. So anyway, this is where I landed today. And I'm really glad that it ended up this way because I have no time to spare. I need everybody who prays and knows God to pray that I complete this um, these initial chapters of my thesis, uh, my dissertation, because it is becoming hectic and I'm just believing God. And I just need you to believe God with me. Anyway, so this will be Wednesday's post. And I'm glad that I'm getting it done now because even though it's going to be a recording to you, um, it's going to be a recording to me. It's going to be new to you. And hopefully you can still receive uh, from it. So over this week, we have been talking about what is grace. And we have been looking at grace from two different perspectives. One perspective is the unmerited favor of God, something that we cannot earn, something that we cannot work for, like a merit, but something that is being given to us, and we have to be willing to receive that grace. The other kind of grace that we have been discussing this week is the nature of God, meaning the graciousness of God, um, and that being a character trait of him, and really there's nothing you can do about it, right? Right. It's just the character of God and it's just how God rolls. And um, what we do is we walk into that grace and we take on that character and we believe God for helping us to understand where we fit into his grace model and how to um, once again, just basically share with our brothers and sisters and not feel as if we are so burdened down that we can't say we're sorry to God and receive his grace. Uh, he is here and he has made grace available to us. So today, as I was walking my three mile hike, because I left my phone somewhere and I have to leave here shortly to go find it. Um, I was thinking about who is grace really for? You know, um, and not in terms of we as people, because I believe grace, of course, is for everyone, clearly, like we all need it. It is a requirement for our life, um, dot, dot, and dot. And so since I've already visited the Basilica today, I thought it was a great thing just to kind of sit down and reflect on the word God had given me about who is the real, who is it really for? Um, of course, it is for the recipient of it, but at the end of the day, you have to have the capacity to give it so people can receive it, right? So I have um, an uh, Old Testament verse that I like to think about. I have a gospel verse and a, a Pauline verse that I would like to just kind of highlight when it comes to who grace is really for. So the first, the first verse is Genesis 6, 8, and it's very short. And it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Just that simple. And if you know anything about Noah and his story, uh, he was really struggling. Uh, like many people in the Bible, when God is speaking to him, he feels like this is nuts. You know, like what you're asking me to do is nuts. 
um, involving my family is nuts. They're going to think I'm crazy. Then I'm going to have to deal with whatever the ramifications of the world um, is going to place on my life when I tell them what you're requiring of me. So it, but it says that, but grace, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God, which let me know that it may not have been readily available to him. It was something that he had to seek after in order to receive. And so I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, the gospel verse is John 1 17. And it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what does exactly does that mean? Well, I've mentioned it before that the law, it was maybe 600 and something laws, right? We could not keep them. Um, no matter what happened, Moses came with the 10 commandments. Okay, forget all 600 some of the laws. Just try to keep these 10. Okay, maintain these 10 because these are the most important 10 and uh, you'll do great. Well, the, that kind of fell through um, because the law's whole goal is to really highlight your sin and how you cannot reconcile yourself through law. You cannot reconcile yourself by obeying laws. Laws have their place, but that is to guide you to submission to God. And that submission and that resignation really has come through the through the person and the the embodiment of Jesus Christ, which is why it says Moses, the the law was given to Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we call Jesus Christ the gospel of grace because grace actually came as a result of Jesus. It was grace was always a part of God's story, his character, his intentions, his unmerited favor was always with his people. But when it came to the ultimate reconciliation with God, there had to be a big move. And God actually sacrificed his son so that we would have access to the ultimate grace of our merited favor. So let's look at the Pauline verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by grace of by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was within me. So let's move from the end, going back to the front of the verse. So it says, I, yet not I, but the grace, but the grace of God, which was with me. So there was a certain grace with Paul. And even though he labored abundantly, he knew that he was able to able to have this type of agility in his faith because of God's grace. So even in his own strength, he still knew that, yes, I have been given a measure of strength in this body to endure long suffering, to deal with persecution, to spread the gospel in spite of what everybody is saying. However, I still know that it is the grace of God. And then he to go back a little bit further even though he said, I, I labored abundantly. But before that, it says, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. So it wasn't, his grace was not in vain. And it made him who he was. Like, I know who I am. So because I know who I am, because I embrace who I am in God, I can receive his grace. Oh my God. And, and then the beginning of the verse, it says, but by, by the grace of God. And, and, and that is what we say as, as Christians, as people, as some non-believers, I hear people saying it all the time, but just by the grace of God, I didn't have a flat tire. By the grace of God, I didn't break down in the middle of the road. By the grace of God, when I broke down, somebody came by. By the grace of God, when the people came by, they had the tools in their trunk. It was all by God's grace. So anyway, now that we've kind of done a little text moving. Um, I want to present something to you that grace is actually for the grace giver. Like it's excellent for the recipient to receive grace, but you think about what is it really doing for the grace giver? So during the government shutdown, during um, that time, there was mortgage grace. During the pandemic shelter in place, I know I received car grace, thanks be to God. Um, children homeschooling, we had to give learning grace. And so when you think about administering these pieces of grace, well, why did we 
why did it, why was the, the, the people on the other side of the phone or the parents standing behind the student or, you know, those in the, in the shelter, the shelter, when we were in the shelter in place, like proper, cause I think we still are to a certain degree, but when we were in that situation and we had to have a certain level of grace for, um, because we weren't able to go to work and we had to receive grace from our, um, our auto finance companies and our electric bills and all of that. What made the people who administered that grace or offered that grace give it? The good news of grace is it is actually administered to the recipient, but it's a manifestation of the giver's maturity. So I think as a, as a person who gives other people grace and situations grace, I realize that when I can, it is based on the maturity that I have at this point in my life in Christ, the tools that I've been given, being able to use them, the resources that I have. If I didn't have those things, I may not be able to give grace. And sometimes people are very ungracious. They uh, do not have the patience. They don't have the time. They say they don't have the money. Um, but when you're able to give grace, that means that you had something that the other person did not quite have yet. So I'm gonna talk about my professor and Grace later, but I just think it's amazing how we miss that as people. We miss the blessing in being gracious. We miss the blessing in administering grace, giving grace, offering grace to those we have power over, those we have been given, we are, we are stewards over. Um, we know that we have a certain level of maturity in Christ or even on our job, you know, and sometimes we still don't administer grace. And it's really sad because it's just like a waste of a tool. You know, um, you can have a lot of tools in your toolbox, but if you're not allowing for grace to, to happen and you use a tool in your toolbox that you that you have like you know what i have this tool and so because i have this tool and i know how to use it and i know you're not ready to use it yet then i'm going to go ahead and lend you this tool or i'm going to use the tool myself to give you some grace until you're ready and what i think is just absolutely phenomenal about it is you know when i think about tools just like physical tools that we fix things with Typically, you can only use one tool at a time. You've got two hands. One hand is using the tool and the other hand is bracing the object, generally speaking. So if we can only use, use one of our tools at a time, then what would make us think that a person that does not have the same tools, the same financial capacity, the same mental capacity, the same spiritual growth that we have, that they are not deserving of grace to be able to learn how to use those tools? I just think it's phenomenal how we as people do not allow for grace to grow in our life, that we can be gracious people. And then a lot of times we just refuse to remember how many times people have given us grace. I know I have received a lot of grace in my life. I can remember there was a test in my ninth grade science class. And um, yes, we have to allow 11 o'clock to come. Um, and I can, I can remember thinking to my, uh, my teacher came by my desk and everybody like, well, let me not say everybody, but at least three or four of us had little tiny cheat sheets like this big. And they just had like A, F, G, A, C, B, C, D, A, C, the answers like on the, on the, on the quiz or whatever the test. And I remember my teacher came by, I have no idea what his name was, but he came by he took the little sheet from under my elbow, he took my test, he gave me another test, and he just threw my sins as far as the east was from the west, he kept it moving. And I took it as grace because he could. He had the power to do it and he did. And from that day forward, and it was just a little quiz, I don't even know why I did that, but I'm transparent enough to say in ninth grade, I was just, I didn't have the tools that he had. And he appreciated me as his student, loved me enough to give me a second chance of grace because he realized I could mess up my whole career. I could get kicked out of one of the best schools in, in this county. And I never looked back and I said, you know what? I am never doing that again. And I apologized and I did it because I realized that not only was I given grace, but then I was given a tool that I could give to somebody else. If, if that would ever come up in my life that I would definitely offer someone grace. So 
what does it show when you have grace? Really what it shows is that you have the fruit of the spirit. You have patience, love, gentleness, kindness, long suffering, perseverance, joy. You have those pieces that a lot of people um, and situations don't have. Um, So actually what you're showing is the maturity in Christ. Patience, love, gentleness, kindness, long suffering, perseverance, joy. All of those things are manifestations of growth in Christ. So I'm going to run down a list where you may fit in. You might be able to find yourself. Um, Hopefully they won't kick me out of the basilica. Um, Otherwise, I may have to stop and do a little more recording. So, okay. So if you are in business, meaning you are, maybe you're a CPA, maybe you run a firm, um, maybe you just run a cafe, whatever you do in business, you, you have some access to capital. So when you're in business, you have the option of grace if you have capital, because that means that there are people that could be either using your business. They may be working for your business. They may be suppliers to your business, and they all may be struggling right now in the middle of this pandemic crisis. But because you have the capital available, you can have a little grace. You can give them a little bit more time to submit to Um, whatever the situation is that they need grace for. Okay, the next one is going to be marriage. If you are in a marriage relationship, your love capacity is actually um, a gift of grace. If you have more love to give than your spouse, then you have a capacity for grace. Now, that does not mean that that grace level is going to last forever. Grace is one of those things. A grace period is given so that the person that is the recipient of the grace at some point in their life can say, okay, I have been given, I have been given time to deal with this particular concern or issue that my spouse is, is, give, is basically laying before me. And you don't want that time to be misused. But if you have a love capacity in your marriage, there's really... You can cover so much sin and and so many mistakes uh, for your lover, for your spouse, for your mate, that if neither one of you had it, then you would not be able to administer grace to one another. And in marriage, it's a it's a it's a it's a 100 percent, 100 percent type of buy in. So at some point you have to say, well, I have given this amount of grace or I have you know, I am the recipient of this grace. The next one is that I thought of was politics. A lot of people play politics, but politics has a very specific role in our life. Um, It can change the very fabric of our life. I know for me, um, it changed how my sister was able to graduate and really um, decreased her options for higher learning because of the different um, pieces that were put into the legislation of no child left behind. So politics has its place. So for us to say, well, I'm not voting or I'm not into that, it's just you forget that there are actually people involved that you care about. And so it's something that you at least need to have some type of fidelity or understanding regarding. So in politics, a lot of times what you have or what you're working with is leverage. You've got the leverage of the people that are your constituency, if you're a senator or Congress person. Um, You have the leverage of your community if you are a councilman or councilwoman. There are all types of um, politicians. Even if you work on a campaign or you are behind a cause that you are lobbying for, you have leverage. You feel like you have some type of leverage that is able to push forward legislation or push forward something on behalf of others. So that means you have some grace that they don't have to administer. So it's really it's really about you. The next is um, your friends and your co-laborers. I know I have found there are times in my life where I just I desire more grace from my friends and my and my co-workers. You know, there are times when I have given more grace because I had it to give. And you know, it's not a weapon. Um, grace is not a, is to be used as a weapon. It is unmerited favor, which means when you're giving grace to your 
friends and co-workers, what you're saying is that I have the capacity to give you this grace. I can't necessarily expect that you have the same amount of grace that I have. And that's OK. I'm not judging your grace. This is not like, a, you know, we're, we're pulling out our grace weapons and seeing which one is bigger. Honestly, what you want to know is that if I have it to, to, to give or I have the wiggle room, it's worth it for me to give that to my friend. Uh, that is what friendship is about is even when you don't deserve certain things, but you realize you have something that the friend doesn't have, you give them space to grow. And that is where the longevity of friendships come from. I am, I, I tell anybody, um, I have the best friends in the world. That is a natural fact. And so what I feel about my friends is that anything that they need to grow, I have to give them the space to grow. And if that means stepping away from the friendship for a time frame, that's what it means. But if I if I if I also don't have that capacity, sometimes I back up too because when you know you don't have the capacity for the grace, you might need to step away and say, you know what, I have given everything that I've given to this relationship, this 20 year friendship that we have, and I cannot put myself in a position where um, I have to go through this again with you. So I'm gonna step back because the capacity is not exactly there for me right now. Just a couple more and then I'm done. So what do you think you need to give children? I thought about all the fruits of the spirit, thought about patience, thought about long suffering and having four children and I'm away from them now. And I thank God for the, those that are taking care of my babies while I am breathing deeply. Um, the most important grace gift that I can offer my children right now is gentleness. They are at a very um, crucial time in their life where it is required. Uh, I have it to give. I have been through my childhood and I'm raising them and I need to be gentle with them. And we need to be gentle with them because they don't have everything that we have yet. And sometimes our expectations as parents, we get frustrated. But if we would always keep in mind the grace model of the unmerited favor, the whole purpose in the grace, you wouldn't need grace if you had the money. You wouldn't need grace if you had the time. You wouldn't need grace if you knew what to do in a lot of situations. But children have mostly, most of the time, they don't have a lot of any of those things. So approaching babies and children requires a level of gentleness. I will be the first to tell you, I've not always been a gentle mother. Um, I come from a queendom and um, that's just a phrase we use to say a whole bunch of women and women have always been in charge. And so for me, you do what the, the big woman say, the taller woman, the woman who's lived longer, has had more experience. You do what she says because she is in charge. And what I have learned is that that can only go so far. Um, they do what you, what you what you say when they respect you and when you're gentle and when you're kind and when you admonish them in love and you embrace their friends, even though their friends make mistakes. And you show them that there's nothing you can do to lose my love. Um, no matter what you become, no matter who you think you might be on the inside, who you're transitioning into, what the world is telling you, I have to be gentle with my babies. They deserve that because God has been gentle with me. And sometimes people have not been gentle with me. And I know how bad it is and how deep the pain goes when you just want gentleness and like the song says try a little gentleness um tenderness i guess is what it says but ideally it's the same concept try a little tenderness all right two more so as a daughter um of parents who are getting older i find myself in a long-suffering category often um because first of all i already know my parents did a lot of long suffering with us so for me to not suffer long with them to, is just disrespectful. Um, and not only that, it's unloving. And so long suffering to me is a demonstration of love and event, it, in actuality, an evidence of grace. And so my father has dementia, as some of you well know, and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I don't want him to be ashamed of it. It's just a part of some people's lives towards the um, end of their life as they get older and, and they age and they forget things. And certain levels of their brain 
don't operate like they used to. And so I have decided that what good is it to me to not administer grace to him when he asks a question three and four times or when he wakes up in the middle of the day like it's morning again and expects us to act like it's morning again? Well, first of all, I have to believe God that I have the mental capacity to do that. And I pray for my mother. I pray for my sister. I pray for my entire family because there are times where we just have to bite the bullet and show grace. And it's not easy because sometimes he really seems like he understands and he knows what's happening and he's just being defiant. Um, He wanders off. He gets into stuff kind of like a child. But at the same time, I know he's my daddy and it's important for me to recognize who he is and where he is at this point in his life dealing with dementia. And um, by grace, we have been saved through faith after almost three years of being on home hospice. He was released because he's not dying. And so I see that as my mother's grace with him and our grace um, that we have received from God to extend his life. So it's kind of on both ends with my parents. I feel like a receiver And I feel like a giver, much more of a recipient than a giver, which makes giving so much easier because when you love people and you know what you've received from them. um, And like I always say, my students give me so much more than what I can offer them. I have my experience, but it's just one of me. So many of them. And so I'm receiving from like 270, 280 kids every day. And so um, when my principal calls me or or someone from the school or community needs me, I go because I am actually a much bigger recipient of the grace than the grace that I give them. And so, and the last one is, um, is self. We don't show ourselves enough grace. So um, we're always dealing with this dichotomy or this dual nature of ourselves, this good, evil, or, or good, bad, whichever way you want to say it. Um, our thinker on um, the, the processing of our of our emotions and how they apply to our life um, and trying to not let them define us but inform us it is a lot and so showing showing yourself kindness is actually a grace gift unto yourself so you're playing both roles you're playing one side of the grace giver and you're you're playing the other side of the of the grace recipient. And so you really when you give yourself grace, it does take more than one step to understand the process by which you are in to receive that grace and to understand what God is doing in your life. And people, I find people who I think are really good grace givers to themselves, they're they have quiet spirits. Um It doesn't matter what their temperament is, whether they're extroverts or introverted or if they prefer being alone or with people. What matters is their peace and their joy because they have administered this this grace to themselves that is remarkable. Uh, Like, well, yeah, I, I didn't get all of my things checked off today, but tomorrow's another day and I have another option and another opportunity. And I just think that, like, I am, I always admire my friends that have that capacity because it's like, wow, I wish I could be that graceful to myself. I wish I could show myself how um, grateful I am to be me and how much I like myself. And yeah, I love myself, but I really like myself. And when you like yourself, it's easier to show yourself grace. And I am getting better with that. I've not always been the best person at it because I was busy being a busybody, trying to show other people grace, I thought. But I realized that the only way I was going to be able to give other people grace, because they weren't always going to understand me, they weren't always going to respect me, they weren't always going to be joyful toward me, was if I show myself some grace. So that is the last one. Um, And so I wanted to say that grace is just as much for the giver as it is for the receiver, if not more, as it demonstrates the infrastructure, the infrastructure you have in your spirit to administer grace to those who need it. And by infrastructure, I mean, you look at this brilliant building behind me. 
and just this entire um, campus is just phenomenal. You might not be able to see a lot of it, but oh God, just the brilliance that is required to to have this type of infrastructure that lasts for centuries. It blows my mind, but I think the bigger thing is what materials did they use on top of the foundation that they had to sustain such beautiful pieces? And really the work of keeping the Basilica is constant. Like there's always somebody buffing the floors. There's always someone manning the bookshops. There's always someone, you know, in, in each segment of the uh, the prayer lofts or the different um, churches within the, the bigger sanctuary. Um, there are smaller places and there's even places where you can meet with a priest. Um, and so it's just a lot of work you know, to maintain the infrastructure. But when you show grace, you are demonstrating that you have something built inside you that people cannot touch. They can put you in jail. They can silence your tongue. They can do things to your body. They can insult your character. They can, um, you know, put your spirit down, but they can't have you because the infrastructure is so strong that aside from basically completely taking you out, they just cannot touch the grace. And so last thing I was going to talk about was my professor. I just want to give a shout out to my professor, Prof Professor Zablowski, because he has given me a exceedingly and, a, and abundantly above what I could think of, hope for, or imagine, just like what the scripture says. And in writing, I realized that the rush that I was putting on myself was eliminating the grace that he was giving me. So as a recipient of grace, I want to end by saying, don't do that. Don't do that. When people give you grace, receive it because the person who's giving it has thought about it. Um, I know when I give my children grace, I have thought about it. And the fact that my professor has taken the time, he sees my potential, he encourages my writing, I don't have a right to be down on myself about what I have not done and what I cannot do. What I do have a right to do is receive the grace, move, keep it moving, thank God for it, and go ahead and do what I need to do. Get down with the get down. Like put some on paper and get it wrong, but get it submitted so that you can show good on the grace that has been given you. So this is Charnay by Grace on location. It is a recording. And um, I hope when you see it that you enjoy it, get something from it. Tomorrow, I have a very special segment on communicating grace. I'm so excited about that. I really hope you are too. And it may be recorded. Just maybe. I'm not sure yet. So we'll see. But I love you. And I can't wait to see you live again, probably Friday. I'm not sure yet. Okay. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.